University um, just down the road. I was there for about eight years. Um, it is a uh, Christian university, historically. Um, in the theater program, we had a guy show up. His name was Brad. Um, Brad Googled Christian University Theater and found Anderson University. Brad was from Texas. He was a brand new believer. Um, he was coming off drugs, alcohol, came, did an audition for my boss, which my boss invited me to, to meet this guy. And, and Brad was in. He was an amazing actor. Um, actually, if you're familiar with Falcon Winter Soldier, he had a featured extra role in that. Um, one of my students was pretty cool. So Brad is brand new to Christianity. No, no historical Christian background with his family. No going to church ever in his life. Just figuring it out, right? He didn't have all the spiritual knowledge to communicate stuff the way Christian people think he should do it. Here's an example. I was having a terrible day. I was a young dad working 60 hours a week, commuting 12 hours, and I was just struggling. And students were in my office all the time. Brad walks in and sees me, and he just looks at me. And he goes, man, what's wrong? And I was like, Brad, I'm just struggling, dude. It's just a rough day. This is going on with my kid. We're not sleeping, and this, and this, and this. And and Brad looks at me and he goes, well, can I pray for you? And I was like, dude, that'd be awesome. And then I could see him try to figure out what it means to pray for someone else. And so he kind of goes. <laughs> and he's like, okay, so God, it seems like you've given Ryan a day that really sucks. And, um, but I read somewhere that you care for your children, and I think he's one of your kids, so could you just kind of help him out today? Cool. And that was his prayer. I'm bawling. Just, boom, ugly cry. Some people would look at that moment and be very, very uncomfortable. It wasn't all the way it was supposed to be, ministry uncomfortable. Introducing or interacting with people who don't know Jesus yet can make us uncomfortable. Think about it. it. Just think about people. People are different, unique, and odd at times, and that's true of all of us. We are all odd, different, and unique at times. Uncomfortable. People live in ways that we don't. Uncomfortable. We observe behaviors and people that we think are unwise or even wrong. And what do we do with that? Uncomfortable. Or perhaps most uncomfortable of all, we hear things from, a, from people about their life that cause us great concern, even safety concerns, and we are uncomfortable. When someone says something difficult, why do we feel uncomfortable? When someone says something really bad, why do we feel uncomfortable? Well, there's healthy fear there. There's a healthy response there for their spiritual and physical health. This is that oh no moment. We hear something in someone's life and we're like, oh no. We don't want them going down that path uncomfortable. We can hear something that isn't part of our own personal experience. This is someone that shares something I've never really or experienced or struggled with. And for me, it's anxiety and depression. That is not part of my story. I don't know how to enter into that moment and understand it experientially, which makes me as a person who really wants to help someone very uncomfortable because I really don't know what it's like to go through what you're going through right now. That can lead to a couple of uncomfortable responses. First, we can dismiss or trivialize their moment because we don't know what it's like. So for those of us who've never struggled with anxiety or depression, that's probably our go-to. Just get over it. Just feel better. Look on the bright side. Count your blessings. All of those responses are uncomfortable and distinctly unhelpful. It's us managing our own feelings in the moment as much as it, as it is trying to help. We're uncomfortable and we try to speak out of our experience. Secondly, 
in that same moment, we might clam up and say nothing because we don't know what it's like and therefore we really don't know what to say. Someone can share something in life group about anxiety, depression, suicidality. And we can be uncomfortable because we lack an answer. Christians are famous for this. We, we, we really want an objective answer for everything. What's the answer? Just give them the answer. Man, that'd be great if life worked that way. I just really don't see that a whole lot in the Bible all the time. We're uncomfortable because we don't have an immediate solution. That's what we mean by answer. You're expressing something like anxiety, depression, suicidality. I want an answer, which really means I want it solved. And that might even be from a good place so that you don't have it anymore. And a little bit of, and so I don't have to deal with it anymore. Because I'm very uncomfortable. We don't want to appear foolish. Or appear like we don't know how to live the Christian life because of our own ignorance. And from a good place, we don't want to speak the wrong thing. Like, I don't want to say the wrong thing to someone who is struggling with an area that I don't understand. Uncomfortable. It can be hard to answer when other people hear what was said, and now we're uncomfortable, wondering how this will affect other people around us who heard it. This is a moment I think life group leaders, especially in Alive, but even as adults, you deal with this moment. Someone expresses something that is very serious, anxiety, depression, suicidality. They say it in front of six other 15-year-old girls, and all of a sudden, I am very uncomfortable. And I'm uncomfortable in a good place because all of a sudden, I have a thought idea that's been presented to everybody else. Thoughts, ideas are never neutral. They land somewhere. What, what do I do? uncomfortable. We may be uncomfortable because we too struggle in this area and we don't want to be a bad example as if our struggle only affirms the other person's struggle. And finally, perhaps it's hard to answer these uncomfortable ministry moments because we're tired. Our give a care meter is low. Because of the present moment that we're in in life, we're weighed down. Hearing another person's burden, struggle, or sin issue is just too much because maybe our personal burden is heavy. And I, I, I'm sure there are additional reasons. I just wanted to get into your heads and give you moments and give you the freedom to say, helping people makes me uncomfortable. And I just want to free you to say that everybody I think I know that's ever really tried to minister to people at one point or another has had an oh no, uncomfortable moment. So what do we do with that? Um, we end up being uncomfortable ministering to the very people we really want to minister to. So here's what I think we do. I want us to begin by remembering that Jesus was in perpetual, uncomfortable positions. Perpetual. Think about it. And, and these are very practical, uh, dumb ideas that just popped into what little gray matter I have in my brain that I can make things happen. But, but think of this. Jesus was perpetually uncomfortable. Jesus held his mom and dad's atoms together while they fed him a bottle. Jesus was the word the rabbis read about at the synagogue when he was seven. Jesus ate food he created. As an adult, Jesus was always around uncomfortable situations. Angry religious leaders, almost constantly for three years. Jesus was around cultural, uh, e even, they wouldn't use the term Christian then, but Christian culture that was uncomfortable because Jesus was kind of always hanging out with the misfits of society. Whether that was Jewish or Gentile, eaters, drinkers, unclean people, adulterers, tax collectors. Jesus was in uncomfortable situations because he had foolish followers. They argued over superiority. And they never really got him. And even while they didn't get him, they thought they got him enough to correct him. 
and then they ended up abandoning him. He was with these people while fulfilling a really difficult calling. Like Jesus' calling was difficult. Think of how he talked about his calling in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wailed. Jesus was in situations that would cause all of us deep discomfort in ministry, but what did he do, and is there something we gain by imitating what he did? And and I I really think there is. So I want to see if we can discover how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Like, like it, the win isn't, we don't, we're, we're not uncomfortable ever again in ministry, we're fine. It's actually not that. It's actually in a given moment, I'm able to recognize I'm uncomfortable with what's going on and I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that reality. So how did Jesus do it? First, Jesus had a clear calling. I'm gonna use a lot of C's so you can remember them. Clear calling. Jesus knew why he was in these scenarios. Jesus repeated why he was around over and over and over. I'm here because the Father sent me. I only do what the Father tells me to do. I'm here to save the world. I'm here to seek and save lost things. His calling was clear all the time. Now, our callings may not be quite as crystal clear as Jesus's. I'm not saying that all of us have some supernatural calling to work in a life. Rather, I'm saying that each one of you who chooses to serve in that way, for whatever reasons, you've said, I'm going to love others, love God by serving in this capacity. So that alone, just that idea, I'm here to love God, love my neighbor in this context, that is your clear calling. That's why you're there. Love God. Love neighbor in that particular context of a live life group leading. So know your role. Know why you're there. You're not there to save the world. You you, you are not there to be a clinical psychologist. Love God, love neighbor in a particular context. Know your role. No show, grow. There you go. Remember that? You guys have been taught that, I hope. Um, So have a clear calling. Specifically, the one another commands collectively reveal what your calling looks like in serving in a life group leader. And you guys, I'm not going to take the time to go through all the one another commands. I think there's 48 of them, 48 or 52, something like that. They're all over the place. Those are many of your marching orders. What does it look like to love someone who says something, whatever it makes me feel uncomfortable? How do I love them? How do I serve them? How do I bear their burden? How do I bear with them in love? Like there are lots, there are lots of things that inform our response to people way before we get specifics. And we're going to get those tools today. But way up here, my calling in this moment is to love, serve, bear burdens. Those things, one another. Um, Be present. Love, serve, teach what you know. Be free from the pressure of a calling that is not yours. You're not called upon to have every answer to every question. You're not called upon to diffuse every uncomfortable moment. You're called to love by being present with this group and pointing them to Jesus. So clear calling. Second, Jesus had compelling compassion. Compelling compassion. What what drove Jesus to do all of the things that he did? Read the Gospels through. Like, if you ever have time, read them all through. Matthew through the end of John. And you'll walk away going, you know what? Jesus kind of is all about love. It's kind of his thing. Every situation, he's driven to do it by this compelling compassion. He has a compassion for people that's overwhelming. Um, The crowds in Matthew and Mark. The widow who lost her son in in Luke. Um, Jesus weeps over the loss of his friend Lazarus and the pain that his two friends, Mary and Martha, are experiencing. Jesus cries over the reality that Jerusalem, which to Jesus would be Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the dwelling place of God's presence. He wept over that place because they rejected him and all he wanted to do was care for them. John 3, 16, which you guys all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5, 
Jesus died when we were weak, strangers, and enemies. Jesus had a compelling compassion that drove him through everything. Every uncomfortable moment, including the cross. Everything Jesus did seems informed with compassion. And brothers and sisters, we are invited to live in that same way. Paul says this, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So there's, I mean, you could do a whole sermon on just that intro. Put on then as God's chosen ones, clear calling, know who you are, know your role. Holy and beloved, you are distinct and set apart. Beloved, you are loved by God. Yahweh himself is looking at you going, yep, I love you. You're, yep, I love you too. You're my loved one. Because of that, put on compassionate hearts. Put on a compassionate heart. So when uncomfortable ministry strikes, you have to be wearing your compassion clothes. Like, your mindset coming into a live life group is key, and I would challenge you, if you are theatrically brave enough, before you leave your house, to put on your compassion clothes. The language Paul uses there is a fascinating section in Colossians that I can't talk about, but it is a take off these clothes and put on these clothes. Dress in a compassionate heart. Compelling compassion. So clear calling, compelling compassion. And finally, Jesus dealt with uncomfortable ministry moments with continual curiosity. Continual curiosity. Jesus never stopped asking appropriate questions. Um, I don't have time to go through all of Jesus' questions, but... An extensive but not exhaustive study reveals that Jesus in the Gospels asks about 135 plus questions. Now, in one way, who cares? Like, we all talk in sentences and questions, but who cares? Here's why it's striking to me about Jesus as he dealt with uncomfortable situations. Jesus was God and he knew all the answers. We ask questions for information or clarification because we don't know. Jesus technically never had to ask a question. He could always tell you exactly what was going on, exactly what you needed to do, and what was really happening in the uncomfortable moment. Every time. Like, grammatically, Jesus never had to use a question mark, because he was God. We're not. And yet he was continually curious. What? Who touched me? What would you have of me? Who do you, Peter, who do you say that I am? Who am I? Jesus' manner reveals humility, respect, honor, and love of another person's words and perspectives. I'm going to ask a really annoying question rhetorical question that I actually hate when speakers use, and I'm going to annoy myself. It's the, ha it's the use of the question, have you ever thought about? It always annoys me. But have you ever thought about, <laughs> I am already annoyed, um, have you ever thought about the reality that when Jesus asked a human a question, like think of Jesus interacting with the woman at the well who tried to argue with Jesus about worship, right? Jesus knew her whole life. Have you ever thought about the reality that when Jesus kept asking her questions, that, that he was actually honoring the reality of her words coming back to him? He wanted her words. I want to hear your words. Tell me your words. What's, what's, what are you really thinking? I really want to interact with you. So as we approach uncomfortable moments in ministry, we should be ready with questions as much as statements. If you want to help yourself be comfortable being uncomfortable, you've got to arm yourself with questions, not statements. Um, which lets us model humility, respect, 
honor and love by asking those we serve and lead questions. We get to be like Jesus. So when you're a 49-year-old pastor like I am, and you're sitting down with a 16-year-old boy, and instead of looking at him and going, hey, this, 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 I'm 49, I know the Bible. I've read the Bible more than you. I've had I have more life experience than you. Let me tell you what you need to know. But instead, you look at him and go, tell me what that's like. What's it like to be you? When that happens, how does that make you feel? Like, I don't think there's anybody in this room, if someone were to ask you questions about that when you're talking to them, and you receive a question back like, hey, how, what's that like for you? I, that's not my experience. Will you tell me what that's like so maybe I can understand? And all of a sudden, the 49-year-old man is adopting the posture of a student to a 16-year-old kid? Adults love when you do that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, tr- I'm not trying to be funny here, but I do this almost every day at some point or another in what I do to try to serve my family. Like, I talk to people every day. Adults love when, when you look at them. No adult wants to come and meet a pastor, walk in and say, this is what's going on, and for me to hand out prescription statements of what they need to do. Nobody wants that. They want somebody who will sit there and go, oh, tell me more. What is this like? How does that affect your family? How does that affect your life? How does that affect your sleep? How do you get up? What do you do? You you gotta be ready. You gotta arm yourself with questions, which unhooks one of our uncomfortable things about being in ministry. We have to have the answers. We actually have to have the questions to try to help us get to answers. And we don't even always have the right questions. So, clear calling, Compelling compassion, continual curiosity. Those are the tools that we need to become comfortable in uncomfortable ministry moments. Why am I telling you this? Because of the focus of today, the reality of teenage anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, thoughts, or declarations. Hearing those words, those three biggies, and and you can go into other realms, you can go into a gender identity words that go with that. I'm I'm bi, I'm coming out, I'm trans, I'm struggling with this. We've got a whole other realm we could talk about where we also get equally uncomfortable. But if we figure, why am I here? Love God, love neighbor by being in this context. Clear calling. I put on my compassion clothes. my, My heart is here because I love these people that Jesus loves. And I'm continual curious. When I hear something going on, I got to be armed with questions more than statements. Clear calling, serving teens, compelling compassion, driven to serve by love, continual curiosity, ask the right questions. And it helps. We're going to get down into some of the more specific areas of information, and and Lynn will help us here. Uh, uh, Questions, how do we interact in these moments? I just want to share with you one general thing that's a little bit out of this realm, and then two very quick stories. Because I, I think the key for my talk this morning is one, focus on Jesus. I hope that helps you. But is also to let you know I'm learning this stuff still. And, and I've interacted with it and I've had to be comfortable in uncomfortable ministry moments. Um, I was meeting with a high school boy um, who had met with somebody else. So I had a little bit of information um, coming in. And uh, part of his declaration when he came in is he's in a very dark part of life. Um, struggling, a, a big part of bullying in his background. And, and I'm talking hardcore bullying, like rough. Um, real questions about his manhood. And I don't even know that he knew what that meant yet. Um, it was more of a stereotype um, of what that meant to be. And therefore felt like a failure because he was... Um, short, not big, not athletic, all of these things. And he just, he, he just, and I, I, I regularly think about just killing myself. Right. Be better off. Now, in that moment, you, you're going to be very uncomfortable. But, but these three things about Jesus, and then that last one, it's stunning that there are very real, clear questions that help in these serious moments that 
you might think are going to make everything more uncomfortable, but they don't. And so I wanted to start with the biggie by illustration in, in suicidality that I, I was so thankful for training where you actually don't kind of soften and pander and back around. You actually ask really kind, kindly, but direct questions. Do you, do you have a plan to accomplish that? Can you tell me about that plan? What's your level of commitment that you're going to carry through with that plan? And I'm uncomfortable as I'm asking the questions I know I've been trained to ask. I can feel it. What I really want to do is soft and hug and it's going to be okay. And, and you know, little Christianese thrown in there about Jesus and wrap this package up and move it on. That's me managing me. But me being comfortable with being uncomfortable is asking these kids these questions, this kid these questions and going, hey, what's, what's going on? How, how committed are you? And there wasn't a real plan. There was no real commitment. And in the back of my mind, I'm checking boxes going, okay, at what, what level? Where, who do I have to call? Do I have to call somebody? Do I need backup on this? And we'll have some of that today. But, but the moment was uncomfortable, but questions were the answers, not solving it. Um, in a more general way, and this isn't actually in anxiety, depression, suicide, although unfortunately it's often connected to it. Um, for whatever reason, God has allowed me to have one bit of unique ministry, and that's learning how to be comfortable meeting with females who have gone through abuse. And for whatever reason, I have a little bit of history where those women are comfortable with it too. Now, I know where those boundaries are. I partner with Lynn a lot in this, but... but I, I've come to this point of being comfortable, being uncomfortable, because I, these people just need someone to love them. And they actually just need to see a, a man who doesn't use them, who will ask questions and not try to steal the power in all these situations and not uh, I, I mean, down to being down to thinking of, I'm, I am not small. And so I have a particular way I sit when I meet with people like that. All the way down to I, I sit as small as I can in a chair. Why? It, it's just one. It, it's a curiosity question that was answered for me years ago of just small. I change my voice. I don't use my bass. I'm not a performer voice in that moment. I go small. I'm just small. As small as a Ferguson can be. You know, but the, the, the point of that is, and I know that's not on a topic today, but, but brothers and sisters, I, I want to free you that if I, I have no super theological training, I'm a guy who loves God's word, loves God's people, and have put myself in these situations, these training moments for 20 years to go, okay, I don't like some of these moments. So, so somebody help me. What, what do I do in these moments? Get, I'm great with a plan. If you can help me with a plan, I'll, I'll be a little bit better. So whether it's meeting with a teen uh, and being able to understand the language of anxiety and depression and how that's being inherited to children now younger and younger and younger and younger and younger. And for us to be able to be comfortable with our discomfort is I think where we begin ministering to that kid is I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. Now I'm going to step into some tools that I've been given and serve my final piece. Um, Dawson, do we have a break in between this and the next thing or do we go right into Lynn? Right. Okay, great. Um, uh, one thing to remember in church world, as we serve, is there is, especially in children, we teach this in child safety and children's ministry, especially children is anybody under 18 at North Hills, by the way, just a reminder. Um, you always have backup. Everybody has backup. Like in moments where something is brought up, you, you can go to Dawson, Dawson who will go to Tim, Tim who might go to Lynn. I, I go to Lynn. I meet with people and I'm like, I don't, 
know what to do with this. We go to Matt, who's over counseling, and counseling has built any number of relationships to refer people who have even more training and specialization, which I've, I've recently done in, in very, two very specific areas of, of, as a pastor, going to the point of, that's not my seat on the bus. I, I can give you God's word, but you actually need some acute care in a particular way that, that's not me. I'll partner with that. But, but I want us to remember, we always have backup. Nobody is looking at you to walk into an alive life group and be the source of all information to deal with anxiety, depression, and suicidality. We're actually just looking at you to love your neighbor, humble enough to listen, clear calling, compassionate heart, continual curiosity, and then go, help. <laughs> Hannah, help. Okay, does that make sense? Good. All right. Now, I'm going to... Uh, <clears throat> intro to you, my, my friend Lynn, um, and let her uh, talk to you for a while. Um, Lynn has served in any number of um, counseling capacities um, uh, professionally, including guidance counseling in high school. She's served volunteer here for years counseling people. She has um, served on staff here for years. Um, uh, she got her uh, licensure um, I could go on with all of those things. Um, Lynn, by nature, is a learner. And what I mean by that is Lynn takes in and holds on to a vast amount of information. And so she, she is this resource for our church, especially in these kind of particular acute realms um, that need counseling, uh, has relationships not just in Greenville, but beyond that where I know she also, even at this point of 30 some years of experience, still goes, hey, what would you do in this situation? Um, she consults with people. Um, so I, I cannot uh, commend Lynn high enough to you. Um, uh, again, just in a kind of way of transparency to help, help us all be in a place where we can ask for help. Um, Lynn has done marriage counseling for my wife and I twice. So uh, I'm also able to submit to Lynn I'm as a counselor. The first time we met, I looked at her and I said, I'm not a pastor. I'm a husband who needs help and I trust you. So say what you have to say. And if we have time, maybe I'll tell a hilarious story about something that she said. Um, she took me at my word um, and spoke to me very honestly. It was awesome. But again, uh, I'm so thankful for Lynn and you're on. And I'd love to pray for you as you come up. Come on up and then you can jump in after I pray. Maybe we all need to talk to God a little bit as we approach the rest of today to listen. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, our, our, our hearts are to help. Like none of us gains a thing by giving up a half a Saturday to just be here for fun. Uh -uh. There's no win. But, but we are just a group of people who want to serve your sheep really, really well. Especially those sheep who are headed towards um, the shadow of the valley of death. Who are headed towards fear. Who are headed towards anxiety and discouragement and depression. And the thought of taking their own life, which you actually talk about in your word too. So I, I pray you would empower Lynn to share what's on her heart with courage. Um, God, give her a voice of confidence that comes from the fact that her Abba um, has made her to be the way she is, to serve the way she is with the gifts that she has. And that's all you expect of her. Um, I pray that you would let us serve the youth of this church really well in an informed and humble way. In your name, amen. 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 Do you know if this is on? Yep, you're good. Okay. Are you handing those out now? Mm -mm. Okay. But when do you want but, me to? Well, there's stuff in the back that um, everyone should have, and I doubt that they do. Dawson, did you hand the stuff out when they came in? Uh, the pieces of paper on the circular table? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have one of those? Does everybody have a little um, pocket card? Okay, most people I don't think have yeah. them, so, okay. Can I get you 
to hook this on my pocket for me? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. Okay. You got the slide? All right. Yay. <coughs> So you guys should all have a little pocket card, a fill in the blank, and a sheet with little blue dots on it. Um, and I have the answers to the fill in the blank in case I miss something, <laughs> which I probably will. Um, so you guys have been sitting for a lot of time. I'm gonna do what I would do with third graders and ask you to stand up and give it a shake. <laughs> <sighs> All right. So we're, we're about to begin the, the um, more, I guess, educational and somewhat boring section, which actually lasts for three hours. So I apologize ahead of time. Um, but I just want you to stand up and get the blood flowing so, so that I could minimize the sleep. Um, but you can sit down when you're ready. Okay, now everybody has the fill in the blank and the blue dots and the little card. Um, grab your coffee and water and whatever. Okay, um, Dawson and I talked, actually the three of us talked, and about two-thirds of the way through our planning session, he just happened to tell us about the little rubric or construct that he uses with all the training, and that's um, no show grow. So unfortunately, you're going to hear that all through what I have to say. Um, so you guys, we need to first of all know what our hope is. And Ryan talked about that a lot. Um, so knowing your hope means understanding the gospel before you sit down with kids. And I don't mean getting a seminary degree. Um, but where is your hope? Um, be prepared to share what your hope is. Um, and know that fear is not sinful. Um, we're going to be talking in and out of uh, the concept of fear and anxiety and depression. It's woven all through suicidality. And um, understanding right at the outset that biblically fear is not in and of itself a sin. Fear is intended to draw us to hope and trust in Jesus. So know your role. Ryan also talked about that. You're a guide, you're a mentor, a friend, a brother, sister in Christ. Um, most of you are, I would assume most of you are in your early 20s or higher, like me. Um, so you, you've been around um, perhaps other kids or younger teens for a long time. And sometimes we forget what our role is when we're sitting with them. So remember your role. Um, most important, I think, is to remember and get to know your kids. Know the basics about your kids, their siblings, um, their order, their birth order, whether or not their parents are divorced, or they're in a blended family, know if there's been a recent loss, just take note of that, because kids will talk about those things. Even the loss of a pet can be a really important circumstance in a kid's life. And you're gonna want to be familiar with your resources, and that's some of what we're doing today. Resources include the Word of God, the Spirit of God that's in you, our counseling ministry has tremendous resources. Um, leaders and parents are your resources. Even parents are actually resources for you. Um, there are other things that you can depend on, other resources. We're going to talk about some of those later in, in um, another section today. But also know your own story. 
Know your own story. And um, so knowing your own story is knowing what it is about you that could relate to or give you an understanding of the people that you're talking to. So I want you to stop right now, and this isn't in your notes, and I want you to think about the scariest thing you ever faced. So just 30 seconds, think about the scariest thing that ever happened to you in your life. You got it? Yeah? Okay, the fear that you experienced in that moment, even though it's a, probably a different circumstance, than the kid in front of you who's sharing their anxieties or fear. But that fear is relevant because it's, it performs as an, a way to understand. It adds understanding to the person in front of you. So you can share that or not, but you can know it and get a sense of what it's like to be terrified and overwhelmed. So that's what I mean by know your story. Be familiar with your own story. Um, so in the show category, I'm just going to run through these. You want to show by example, by how you live your life, by the things that you say and the things that you do, imperfectly owning your imperfections, but show by example that you're following Jesus, that you're learning and growing and show up is um, a primary reason we're here today because we're going to talk a lot about what it means to show up. So what you do, as you guys I'm sure already know, what you do matters more than what you say. And kids are going to follow and replicate what you do, not necessarily what you tell them to do. So show compassion, and Ryan uh, also covered that, talked about that. Um, and compassion in my world means that we identify with suffering. And identifying with suffering means kind of what I was saying a minute ago about the fear piece. When I identify with someone's suffering, I've reached down inside and found a morsel, a tiny bit of understanding that helps me to get what it's like for this person to be who they are. So showing compassion is super, super important to con connecting with kids. Being quick to listen and slow to advise is in the compassion cat category too. And you want to show grace. Listen and don't assume that you know the backstory. And we're, when you're working with kids, you, you don't sweat the small stuff. That's kind of a canned phrase but they say all kinds of things. And so ask for discernment to know what's important and what's not, and take in the whole picture, not just the, the little phrase or the thing that they said last week that was oh, overwhelming. Um, take in the whole picture. Who is this kid? Who are their parents? Who are their friends? Um, what do they look like? What do they smell like? What do they sound like? All that adds information to your understanding of who this kid is. And of course, you want to show grace. Listen and don't know, assume that you don't know all the things. Um, so we're going to grow in what you know today. And I'm sorry for all the repetition. <laughs> um, the, right now, I, wanted, I want you guys to think of <clears throat> your kids and your groups and not just uh, this school year, but in years past, if you've worked in the life for a while. And I want you to think about the, the scariest or craziest thing a kid has ever said to you. And can I get a volunteer to write these on the board for me? Oh, can you stand? Is it okay? She's in a boot. She had surgery. <laughs> There you go. Okay, I just want three or four. So what is the scariest, most upsetting, oh my word, I can't believe that person is saying this right in front of me thing that a kid has said to you? I don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I can go on. Holy cow. That's breathtaking. Yeah. 
How about another one? Yeah, so suicidal talk. Yeah. Yeah, that is breathtaking. Scary to hear. Yeah. I think one thing in particular is that I can't talk to anybody. Yeah, I can't talk to anybody. Isn't that incredibly sad and hard? There's nobody that that child can talk to. Let's do one more. That's huge. All kinds of warning signs go off, right? I don't want to go home. I'm afraid to be alone. You don't understand what my life is like. You don't understand what my life is like. Yeah. So what does that draw you to want to do? Understand. To understand. Yeah, to know more. I think that's the cry of most kids' hearts, <coughs> even if they put up a wall. So, oh wow, that's tiny. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. Okay. So when you think about these statements, yeah, Yeah, we're good. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) When you think about these, these words of real kids in real situations, which statement sounds important like you need to listen and ask questions and maybe know more? All of them, yeah, I would say, even though they're, they're kind of diverse. Um, which one do you think might point to anxiety? Uh, yeah, you don't understand what it's like. I can't talk to anyone. I don't know if I can go on. I think anxiety could be a part of all, all of them, right? What about depression? Suicidality, I don't think I can go on. Yeah. Okay, so we have a good ex- uh, example of what kids can say in a spontaneous or random moment in a group. My hope is that today um, you won't feel like you got the wind knocked out of you and you'll be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Thank you for that. Um, So when we're talking about these kinds of things, it's important from from my perspective for you guys as alive leaders and people who are involved in kids' lives to know the main things. You can't know everything. You can't know all the things about even the main things. But there are four or five really important big umbrellas that you need to be kind of familiar with to recognize, to know when to ask for help um, and when to guide a student to ask for help. So they include anxiety, depression, same-sex attraction and transgender statements, and suicidal ideation. I'm sure there are others, but those are the biggies that kids in the teen years tend to Um, be consumed with or feel or gravitate towards. So anxiety, in my humble opinion, is considered one of the coolest mental health issues to have today. And if there's a a fragile identity and there's a, a little bit of anxiety, saying that I have anxiety adds a dimension of identity to a a growing human. It's not healthy, but that's what kids do. Um, Depression, I feel depressed, the same thing, because depression has been still kind of, not quite as cool as anxiety, but it's still, you know, kind of an identificatory way to be. I am a depressed person. I'm depressed. I have depression. Same-sex attraction and transgender are also super hot things to struggle with now. And they're very um, culturally relevant at this time in, in, um, in our 
culture, particularly in the West. Um, and suicidal ideation possibly is uh, related to identity too, because it's a way to gain, um, not attention, but to gain cl uh, closeness with people. Um, but whenever someone suggests that they don't want to live or has suicidal ideation, we have to take it seriously. We must take it seriously. We're going to talk a whole lot more about that um, in another section later. So all four of these can be related to identity struggles. And um, this is, I, I would say, outside the realm of, um, in some ways, outside the realm of licensed counseling in a, in a secular sense. But I'm a gospel center counseling person, and that, that's my focus. I love Jesus. And so when I hear identity language, I want to talk with kids about who they are. So what, what should you listen for? Listen for statements that suggest who the person thinks they are. For example, what I do tells me who I am. Um, or my success and my failures tell me who I am. What others think of me tells me who I am. That's super common. What do we call that in Jesus' world? What other people think of me? Fear of? Fear of man, yeah. So that's a, I want to say that's kind of an old phrase, but the concept and there's a lot written about that. I've, I brought some books that you guys can look at in a break um, that's helpful in the arena of fear of man. Um, but that can be the source of a lot of anxiety in kids' hearts. And then the fourth um, identity language phrase is what I feel tells me who I am. And that's very much related to same-sex attraction, transgender issues. We're not going to talk about that chunk today um, just because we don't have time. But it's, um, it's an important topic. If you have kids that are struggling with same-sex attraction or transgender, I'd love to talk with you. So just um, send me an email and we'll set up a time. So kids who are depressed and anxious mostly need to be heard. They need someone who is willing to listen. So giving space for that, standing around after group, um, meeting them for coffee is, is a way to create a safe space for them. Um, when you're talking with them, if what you see feels and seems like anxiety or depression or they're even using that language, don't assume it's just to get attention or just to be cool. Uh, assume there's something really going on there and be willing to listen. Um, and, and be willing to make space for silence when you're having that conversation. Silence is one of the most important tools in counseling. So what you don't say sometimes matters more. So what do you do when you have an anxious kid? Have you ever had a kid in front of you who's actually um, experiencing anxiety? Anybody? Raise your hand. Yeah? Oh, my goodness sake. Okay. Well, Beth, of course. Um, Beth works in a pediatric emergency room, <laughs> so she sees that. Um, so there's a really simple tool that I'm going to teach you guys that you can teach your kids in your small groups, especially if you have more than one kid who is experiencing anxiety. Um, and then if you teach them this, you can remind them week after week. It's called square breathing. Does anyone here know what square breathing is? We have a couple people. Okay, so we're going to learn this. And it's super simple. And the reason why they call it square breathing is, is because it helps us to remember. So for people who are anxious, <clears throat> a square breathing tool can actually bring the level of anxiety down. This is something I do when I meet with people in my office. Um, so square breathing is breathing in. You guys are going to laugh. Holding. Breathing out. 
and resting or just holding essentially. So it's just a deliberate breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. But if they can think about a square and even like put their finger on a piece of paper and breathe in, hold, exhale through the mouth and then rest and then do that three or four times. And the result actually is to lower the anxiety level. It's a biological thing. It's the way our brains work. It's how God made us. So that's a simple tool you can teach a kid who has um, even a chronic anxiety issue. And they can employ that anytime when they're in school, at home, or in group. Okay, square breathing. So I want to take a couple minutes and talk about um, listening skills and how to listen. Um, again, Ryan touched on that. Listening is listening's the most important thing. Um, and how to listen is right there at the top of a gaining an understanding. So listening starts with paying attention and not being distracted. You want to listen carefully and completely. And this is the hard part. You want to listen to understand, not to respond. And then allow for silence. And there, there's some things that you can tune into when you're listening to a kid. You want to listen to something I call keywords. So keywords are emotional words, um, words that describe in maybe intense language. Um, like I feel beaten up by my parents doesn't mean my parents beat me up, but it's a very important keyword that helps you to understand what it's like to be, to be them. So listen for keywords, um, listen for a sudden change or a big change that they're describing, like um, my dad just left the house a week ago and nobody's seen him since. That's super important for you to take note of. And then for emotional words, keywords are emotional words usually. Listen to those and respond to those and ask questions. Wonder what it's like to be them. I like to call that sanctified curiosity. So we're not well, we actually are, according to Hebrews 10, 14, we are sanctified and being sanctified. Um, but our sanctified curiosity is informed by the Spirit of God. So if a question occurs to you, or a keyword has just landed on you, ask a question that is curious. Wonder what that means, what's under that, what's behind that, or tell me more about that. That's one of my favorite questions to ask adults and kids. Tell me more about that. What was that like? Um, so what, when I sit with somebody and when you sit with your kids, even before you sit down in group, um, I want you to wonder what it's like to be them wonder what it was like two hours ago, wonder what it was like when they were in school, and just listen and observe wide open. And you're gonna learn all kinds of things about your kids. Um, Ryan used a phrase, I actually wrote it down, Ryan, when you were talking, questions are the answer. I love that, I'm gonna rip that off. Um, so questions usually are the answer regardless, at least initially, regardless of what the issue in front of you is or the problem. Um, questions that are open and not closed. Does anyone know what an open-ended question is? Can the answer can vary. Yeah, the answer basically has to be more than just yes or no. Um, and a closed question is, what time is it? What color is your jacket? Did you go to the store? It's a yes or no or a simple answer. And typically we want to ask open-ended questions in order to get more information as our sanctified curiosity is operating. Um, 
And in the background of that is that wondering what it's like for them to be them. So someone give me an example of an open-ended question. What was that like? I, I didn't tell her to answer. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> what was that like? Or How did that make you feel? So you guys just both identified the two keywords that help with those questions, what and how. An open-ended question with a kid, especially a teenager, um, will get a whole lot more information if that question begins with what or how. So when you're planning to sit with somebody, like if you're going to meet them for coffee and you already kind of know what the topic's going to be or what the concern is, ask or consider asking them what and how questions. Think about that ahead of time. Maybe even think about the kind of questions you could ask. Okay. Um, these questions lead to more understanding, deeper understanding, but they also communicate to the person you're with that you're tracking with them, they matter to you, you care about them. And as you're talking to kids, you're going to hear and observe things that maybe blow your mind or they're super concerning. Um, and maybe some of the things that they say are um, outrageous or you think they are an exaggeration. Keep listening. Because kids who say outrageous or impulsive, weird, crazy things have something going on. There's a reason for that. And your role as a, a listener, as a mentor and guide, can help to open that up and hear the stuff underneath, what's inside. Um, so as leaders, um, my heart for you guys is that you'll also come to know the warning signs. Like you sit with these kids every week, you do group, you do activities, you go on um, trips and just you have a lot of contact potentially um, so you have opportunity to observe kids in all different kinds of emotional situations so i'm going to list some of the key warning signs and then we're going to take a little break um, and then we're going to circle back and pick through the warning signs in a lot more detail so these are this is not inclusive this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list. Um, changes in behavior, changes in dress, changes in friend group, attendance, affect. When a kid just makes a big change, it's like, what's going on there? It doesn't necessarily mean something bad, but it's something to pay attention to. Talk of depression. And again, that doesn't mean they're depressed, but it's a warning sign. Pay attention to that. Observe chronic fear, hesitation, and social anxiety. And those are things that you can pick up on when you are meeting with kids. Um, just watch them. If they're very slow to join in or never answer questions, um, or you know, are always kind of sitting back. Just attend to that. Take a note, because um, it may mean something. Hair pulling, evidence of cutting and bruising, or exhaustion. Those are all warning signs and concerning symptoms or behaviors. And here's one that you might you might overlook, and it's what I call that distant staring into space look. The blank kind of nothing look. Um, that's super important. That's, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that in just um, a few minutes after our break. But that is a, an important thing to take note of. And then chronic lying um, is a symptom of a lot of things, not just lying. And chronic lying can be um, hard to pick up on because if they're really good at it, <laughs> you don't know. But when you pick up on it and you see a pattern, 
then um, that's something we need to move toward and wonder about. Okay, we are gonna make the bend to suicidal ideation and um, talk about some heavier things. Um, I just want to reiterate that the point here isn't for me to train you guys like your licensed professionals. It's to inform you about what to look for and to deeply encourage you to ask for help and input. Um, but these are, uh, there are a number of things that we're going to do and hear that will help you to see and understand what's happening in front of you when so someone says they don't want to live. Um, we're going to start with the seven myths of suicide or the seven myths of suicidal ideation. And uh, I've found that when I've done this training in the past that there are always people in front of me who believe some of these myths. So that's why I want to start with this to just get them off the table. Um, so here we go. Myth number one. Real Christians don't experience suicidal thoughts. So the truth is, if we look in Scripture, we see Job and Moses and Elijah and Jonah and others um, fearing for their life but really wanting to die or just moaning and deeply wondering if death would be better. Um, but in church history, we have John Donne, Martin Luther, MLK Jr., and Francis Schaeffer, all who wrote about their longing to die and suicidal ideation. And um, there are more contemporary people who've, who've expressed those kinds of thoughts too. So being a Christian doesn't mean you're exempt from uh, having suicidal thoughts at all. It means you know, that you're still a human being and face really, really hard things um, that sometimes add up to in, in your mind, like, I would rather not be here. Um, okay, myth number two. People who are suicidal are really just seeking attention. That's a super common myth, and it is not true if you look behind the attention getting piece. Sometimes there's a desire for attention, but every time, 100% of the time, when someone mentions suicide, thinks, thinks about suicide, something's wrong. Something's very wrong. Um, so even the need for attention in that way represents something we need to be concerned about and move toward. Um, so any threat to suicide um, should be considered serious and important. Um, so that's not true. People who are suicidal are not just seeking attention. There's something going on there. Okay, number three, people who kill themselves are just being selfish, angry, or vengeful. So I will say that sometimes... Anger is a piece of the puzzle. Vengeance is, you know, sometimes seen in a letter that's left by someone who takes their own life, a uh, desire to hurt someone else. But again, there's something else going on there. Suicide is essentially about ending pain. That's what it's about. It's about solving a problem. That's super simple. We're all problem solvers, and sometimes A plus B equals I don't want to live or I can't live anymore. Even though I would hope that we all know that that's not deeply rational, there's always a way forward, even if it's suffering the consequences of our wrongdoing or the shame of admitting we've done something horrible um, or suffering the consequences um, in a real way of what someone else has done to us. There's a way forward, and it's probably hard, but death doesn't have to be the answer. Um, number four, people who are suicidal 
don't tell anyone. And that's like crazy not true, super not true. Um, 60 to 70 percent of people who eventually attempt suicide tell someone and are often not believed because our first thought is, oh, they would never do that. They're not that kind of person or their life isn't that bad or they've reassured me that they really wouldn't. Um, so m most people who attempt suicide do tell someone. Many people also drop multiple hints like, um, I'm going to be going away. And these are ones I've actually heard. I'm going to be going away. Or you don't have to worry about me anymore. Or after next week, you won't have to worry about me anymore. Um, and others will exhibit signs, such as a sudden positive turn in their affect and attitude. It's like they're depressed, 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 er, super happy. Everything's fine. Oh, that was just... You know, that was last week. Everything's fine. Um, a sudden positive turn um, and giving away their precious possessions. Sometimes that's the only sign that, in retrospect, people see um, after someone's taken their life. It's like, well, last week he came to me with his grandfather's pocket knife and wanted me to have it just because I was his best friend. <clears throat> so unless you know that that's a, a potential sign of concern, you might be like, oh, wow, thanks so much. That's amazing. Um, so, you know, again, pay attention to these things, particularly if you already know this person has a, a depressive nature or they're super, super depressed in general or they've experienced a deep loss or really... Um, uh, really concerning event in their life, like loss of a job or breaking up with their girlfriend or boyfriend. Those are things that can put people over the edge. Okay, number five, if someone wants to kill themselves, there's nothing I can do about it. So that's actually just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Um, it's better to risk uh, someone getting mad at you and losing a friendship than losing a friend. So moving towards someone uh, who's expressing suicidal thoughts <coughs> is the right thing to do, and doing everything you can to prevent them harming themselves is the right thing to do. It's also the legal thing to do. Um, it's the best thing to do. Um, they've actually um, done research on people who attempted suicide and didn't follow through, asking questions around this particular topic. If someone wants to kill themselves, there's nothing they can, that you can do. And they've said that people who stepped in and did something were the reason why they didn't complete their suicide. So we can do something if we pay attention and listen and do the uncomfortable things, ask the hard questions. Um, uh, number six. The sixth myth, most suicides occur over the holidays. Uh, most of you should know by now when most suicides occur. Anybody? Guys. It's May. May. Statistically, May has the most suicides of any month of the year, um, which has really puzzled researchers. But they've come up with some ideas, and one is that May, typically, because of the rhythm of the school year, is the point at which things end and things begin. And so, especially young people, but even adults, come to May, and spring and summer is supposed to be the, the advent of joy and vacation and doing things. But for a lot of people, it represents loneliness, isolation, I, I have nothing to look forward to. Um, so it exacerbate, exacerbates an already existing depression. So that's why every year at the end of April, I send out an email to all the leaders. Um, you guys should get uh, that email, would be forwarded by Tim or Dawson, that says, hey, heads up, this is when we need to really pay attention. We need to pay attention 12 months of the year. 
Um, but it's just super important. And, you know, again, researchers aren't really sure why, but that's one of the reasons they think. Um, so, make sure I said everything about that that I want to say. Uh, most su suicides uh, generally occur in late spring and early summer, so May. So number seven, talking directly with someone about suicide may give them the idea to complete suicide. I've had, oh my goodness, many people say, well, that, that is true. You're not supposed to talk about it because you're going to plant the idea in their head. Um, but the deal is when a person is suicidal, they've already thought about it. So extensive re research has shown that asking really direct questions actually normalizes the fear and the thought of suicide. The fear that you're having a thought and the fear of doing it, the whole piece is normalized when you ask a direct question. So um, asking the direct questions frees them to talk about those deep, hard feelings. It's like, oh, they said the word, so now I can talk about it. Um, it, and I've seen this play out right in front of me a number of times. Um, so the only way to discover the factors that are involved in suicidal ideation is to ask the questions. Um, the direct questions, you should have a slide. Do you have a direct question slide? There it is. Um, these are sample direct questions, um, and there are ways to soften them, but I would encourage you to just say the thing, you know, just ask the questions. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Have you ever tried to hurt yourself before? Do you think you might try to hurt yourself today? Have you thought of ways that you might hurt yourself, or do you have a plan, another way to ask that? Do you have pills or weapons in the house? That's really direct. So you're sitting there, you know, after a live group, somebody's just let that slip. I, uh, I just don't want to live anymore. I'm thinking I might, I might kill myself. That's when you put your big girl and big boy panties on and ask the hard questions. Um, asking follow-up questions can help you really understand the degree of lethality of their thoughts, um, the intensity of their thoughts. Uh, on a I like to ask people on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being I'm going to kill myself after this conversation, 1 being I'm just having these feelings, I'm not, I'm not I don't have a plan, um, it's something in between. And then how often in the last seven days have you had these thoughts? And have you made preparations? So if somebody tells you they have a plan, that doesn't mean they have all the tools for the plan, um, and I found that asking that question, have you, have you made preparations? If they say they know what they're going to do. I had a young lady tell me once that she had a plan, and I asked her this question, have you made preparations? And her plan was to walk about a mile from home and jump off a bridge. And so she had made, she thought through the whole process, when is mom going to be gone? Um, this is where I'm going to go, and I know how to get there. And... So she had made preparations essentially by imagining herself thinking that through and knowing what time of day and so on. So we're going to practice this right now. Um, I found and research shows that you can learn, learn, learn all the things. You can read the questions, but until you think them and speak them and hear yourself say them, um, it's it, until you do that, you're not going to be at all comfortable with actually saying them. So even though we're not talking to suicidal people, I'm going to have you guys pair up. So you need to find a partner, and you're going to ask each other these questions. And it's going to be weird, I promise you. <laughs> but this exercise is going to begin to lay the track down in your brain for having said them. It's like, okay, I've actually uttered these words before with a human in front of me and they answered. And so you don't, if you have been suicidal in the past, you don't have to answer yes. And so this is kind of a practice. Um, if you want to, that's fine. 
um, but you only have like three minutes to do this. So it, it might not be possible to get down into all the details. Um, so pair up with somebody with your questions, which are on the, they're on your sheets, aren't they? Yeah, okay. And I want you to take turns. One person ask all the questions and the other person answer. Fake answers are fine. And then swap and the other person ask, okay? Find a partner. Okay, you have one minute. Okay, wrap it up. Okay. Okay, what was that like? Did it feel weird to ask those questions? We're, we're going to talk about that, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was a little weird, and uh, unless you've met with people in this situation, it's like, ooh, it's so weird to actually think and say and hear those words. Um, did any of you hear something that was like, holy cow, I didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of people nodding. So that's what happens, right? That's what happens when you're talking to a real person, a real kid, and you ask these questions like, whoa, that's amazing. And what do I do now? So that's where being comfortable with being uncomfortable, having thought this through, having practiced saying these things is so important, so important. Um, so what we just did by asking those questions is we went through the technical list of the five prompts.
primary markers for suicidal risk, which are ideation, and that just means thoughts and considerations, and intent to die, the likelihood of following through, whether or not there's a plan, is there means, we asked the question that talked about means, and imminence, which means how um, serious is this person, how imminent is the potential event. So, you guys have a little pocket card, right? Everybody has the pocket card? I want you to turn the pocket card to the section that has the questions. There are three questions on there that um, encompass the, the main things, the main questions that you need to ask. So what happens um, with uh, sitting with someone, when you're sitting with someone, is that you're like, oh, what, were the, what were those questions again? Oh man, what was that other question? You can just casually pull that out and say, hang on one second, and pull your prop out and read the questions, ask the follow-up questions. Um, so I would love for you guys to carry these with you wherever you go. Stick it in your purse um, or your wallet. Um, amazing story. I did this training a couple years ago uh, for our lay counselors. And um, not long after that, maybe four or five months later, I got a call from one of the men that had been in the training. He had his pocket card in his pocket and was talking with a woman on the phone who expressed suicidal ideation. He pulled the questions out, he followed the, he asked the questions, determined that she was serious, was able to get her address, got somebody's attention, called law enforcement to go to this address, and she was serious and preparing to take her life. Um, she was hospitalized and she's still alive that I, as far as I know to this day. But the pocket card was the key for him and having practice just like you guys did. Um, it's an amazing, simple little tool. So on the other side of your pocket card is the uh, contact information for, I don't have one in front of me, the text line. There it is. Um, so we have the 24-7 helpline and the website. Um, and the help and chat line. Um, and anybody can call this. You could call this. Like if you just talk to a kid and you're like, oh, I can't reach a pastor, I can't reach Lynn, what do I do? You can call this and say, I'm a, a youth leader and I need some advice on what to do next. And they will help you. Um, the text line, is the text line? Yeah, text HOME to 741741. Um, I have had several young people in the last couple of years use both the text line and the call line when they felt overwhelming suicidal thoughts and were greatly helped. It's not a believing source, but it's 24-7 with really trained people who are going to help a person come away from the, the ledge. Um, so I, I've had actual feedback from kids who've used this. Um, so I want you to add something to the bottom. In July, across the nation, they are opening up a three-digit um, call line for anyone to, to call, like we call 911. It's 988. So I want you to write that on your card. And um, I think these are shiny, so it, you might have to let it dry. Be careful, it'll smear. <laughs> um, 988 starting in July in some parts of the nation it's available now like Atlanta and, and New York but in July it'll convert to 988 and the other line will remain uh, accessible as well it, a lot of kids memorize this or they put it in, in a speed dial on their phones um, but that makes it even easier for anybody um, so hang on to these if you have any questions about this just let me know Okay, um, so Anna asked, 
the most important question, so what do you do? <gasps> what do you do? Um, you, you have your card, your practical suggestions and questions, not suggestions, your practical questions, your direct questions and follow-up. Um, first of all, you need to remember that this isn't all up to you. It's not up to you to save someone, but it is up to you to ask for help, to get help, to pursue help, provide help, contact parents, um, notify your department head, which would be Dawson or Tim or a pastor. Give this person the 24-7 helpline number and text line information. Give it to them. Tell, you know, write it down, make them write it on their hand or whatever. Um, and identify their support system with them there. Once you've walked through a conversation, identify who, who are your people. Who can you reach out to when you feel overwhelmed? Now, if a person is explicitly suicidal, um, you don't have many options. You, you have to get them help, stay with them until help arrives if you're with them. Um, they may need to go to the hospital. You can call 911, they'll send an ambulance. And um, EMS is trained to ask certain questions just like you have and other questions and determines uh, lethality, suicidality, and they will um, take a person to the hospital. Um, sometimes law enforcement comes too. <clears throat> um, so that could be a role that any of you find yourselves in, and, and God willing, you won't, but you're now prepared a little bit more than you were a few hours ago. Um, so be ready to ask for help on th this person's behalf. Um, so asking the hard questions, the direct questions, frees that person to share their deepest, darkest thoughts. It, it just opens that door. Um, so be, be direct is kind of the first, it's the first step out of the gate. Um, but then what do you do? If, if you're in a conversation and the person isn't sitting there with a gun in their lap, um, then you, you have some time to have a conversation. Maybe they're, they're not, they don't have a plan, but they're just feeling really hopeless or they've had a horrible thing happen in their family and they don't know how they're gonna go on. Explore their personal meaning and purpose. And that, all that means is where, where is God in this? And tell me, tell me about where he is in your life um, what do you think about when you think about God? And you might get some super negative things uh, or dismissive things, but you can ask the question. Um, you can also share with them God's purpose for them. Open to Psalm 139 um, and God who is with them from before they were born to today sees and knows everything. That could be extremely comfort comforting for someone who feels isolated and alone. Um, and talk about the relational impact of suicide. Um, and, and this is obviously all in the context of listening, okay? I'm saying say all these things or talk about these things. You need to listen with your heart wide open to understand what it's like to be them with the pain that they're experiencing. Um, but the relational impact of suicide can be the most meaningful thing that you share. Um, something that I've said to, I don't know how many people who've expressed suicidality in front of me, that my life would never be the same if they took their life because now I know them and they're a real person to me and they matter to me even if I just met him an hour ago. Um, but communicating that I will be, me right here will be forever affected if you take your life. Um, another thing you can do with kids even, and adults, but kids especially, is give them a language of lament. Um, teach them to lament. 
help them to see in scripture that God is okay with really heavy and hard words. Um, and God's word is full of passages, scripture, and situations that describe, you know, on the edge of your seat, death and fear and overwhelm and I want to die. It's all in there. Um, so suffering is not good, but it's okay to talk to God about it. It's okay. And lament is the primary form that God has given us. Um, the lament psalms that I've used are 6, 13, 27, 20, and 22, 77, 88, and 91. And hang on. <laughs> Okay, here's a longer list. 3, 6, 13, 22, 25, 28, 44, 86, 88. 88 is the hardest, saddest psalm out of all of them. 88. 90 and 142. And there are more. Um, so, so sometimes... Psalm 88 is, is the one because it, it lands in a mud puddle. It's like there's, there's no real um, like uplifting piece at the end, which, which, can, which can be very upsetting, but it can be very real to someone who's in that place. Um, and so give them, give them words to talk back to God, to say to God, and show them in Scripture that God gets this, you know, he's, he's not shying away or turning away from them because they're having hard and dark thoughts. Okay, um, of course pray with them. Um, and sometimes we are uh, in a hurry to pray, but that's really because we want it to be done. <laughs> Um, because it's so uncomfortable, but at some point, pray with them, pray over them, touch them, like put, put your hand on their shoulder or their knee or their foot, and, and engage with them in prayer. Um, use God's words when you pray. Talk to God using his words. Pray a psalm over them. Express their pain as you pray in we language. And so what you're doing when you do that with someone who is suffering is you're saying, you're locking arms and you're saying, Father, we are together in this. This is so hard for us. You're talking on their behalf to God, but in, in we language helps them to know they're not, a, not alone. And then expressing your faith that God will hear and that God's character never changes <coughs> Expressing that in prayer on their behalf is in some ways a reminder to them, but it's also inviting God to be who he is. Be faithful to your promises, God. You say you hear. Hear us now. This person is really hurting right now. Meet him or her right where they are. Um, so you, it, in that context, you're offering hope. That's the next bullet. Offering hope because hope, I, this is so corny, but hope is a noun. It's, it's real. It's not this fake thing. Romans 5 tells us that hope doesn't disappoint because it's real. It comes from God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So we have something to offer a person who feels hopeless in the real person of Jesus who's present and you, you can speak with not, maybe not urgency, but passion when you're talking with somebody in this place because they're feeling it, man. They're, it's all in there. So don't be afraid to be real. Um, and then in the context of offering hope, capital H, um, I love the idea of borrowed faith. Um, I ha this has been meaningful to me for 
decades. But uh, the way I understand borrowed faith is that I have hope that God is able to do something. So I have hope on their behalf. So I can say that directly to this person. I can pray that as I'm sitting with them. Um, and I've said, again, many times with people, I have great confidence in God concerning you. I know it feels hopeless, but I have great confidence that God knows what he's doing. He's right here. So that's my hope, that they can borrow from me and they hear from me. Um, so next bullet, speak the truth. You always want to speak true words and identify with their suffering. Um, do you guys know what that means to identify with suffering? Yeah, it's it, it, that's all it is, and it's the you know the Jesus way to describe empathy. Um, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but when we identify with suffering, we're saying, "Oh, that's hard." because it is so when you feel the hard of what they're saying you can actually let that come out of your mouth like man I, i'm so sorry that sounds so hard and just a, a word like that can lift a person up help them to know they're not alone they're not crazy for feeling the way they do they're not wrong for feeling overwhelmed um, and that you know, in an objective person's opinion, what they're going through is really hard. And you can, you can say, I'm so sorry this is happening for you. Um, so identifying with suffering is a key. It, it really is a key to connecting with this, this person in front of you. Um, you always want to speak true words about God. Don't give them false hopes or everything's going to be fine. You'll see next year it'll all be in the past. Please don't say things like that. It's so tempting. And again, that's because we feel uncomfortable and we just want to land in the positive arena. You know, positivity rears its ugly head at times. Um, and that's not the time for positivity. It really isn't. Um, you want to av avoid simplistic platitudes, um, things like that. It'll be all right. You'll see. You'll get through this. It'll feel bad for a while, but it'll be okay. Those are the things we should not say. Um, and so when someone is pouring their heart out to you about the reasons why they don't want to live anymore, whether they're explicitly suicidal or not, that's not the time to minimize what it is they're experiencing. That's the time to go, oh, to identify with their suffering, but not to give them you know, overt promises, like, God's going to work that out. You'll see. It'll be fine. Um, and the final thing is offering them a practical connection. Um, this, is a, this is a really interesting thing that grew out of research about 15 years ago. Um, there was a, a group of researchers that followed up with um, with people who had been hospitalized for suicidal ideation. So when you're hospitalized, that means that you're serious about taking your own life, um, explicitly suicidal. So they followed up with people after they left the hospital in two ways. One, they, everyone that left received a card from one of the people that was involved in their care, a nurse, a doctor, a, a, one of the caregivers in the hospital, a handwritten real life card, and then they followed up with a phone call. And then they went back, so I guess the third thing is they went back and asked all these people a year or two later, um, how did that land on you? And they wanted to find out if they tried to commit suicide again. And they found that they compared that group to uh, groups that they didn't do these steps with, with the card and, and the phone call. And they found that there was a large percentage of people who did not try to commit suicide again. And they cited feeling like they mattered to a real person as the reason from a card from somebody in the hospital who helped them. And, and, and so there's been um, 
kind of a shift in, in aftercare for people who have suicidal ideation and are hospitalized. Um, I don't think it's all over the country, but it's growing. To do this sort of thing, to make it more personal, more connected, and then to connect this person with this person once they leave. And that might be a helper. It might be someone in the community who's been through this before. Um, but you guys being potentially the first person to really sit and pay attention to suicidal thoughts uh, are the person, you're the person who can connect them with someone who will keep following up. Um, and you can also be that person too, to say, hey, how's, how's it going? Um, or you don't see them for a couple months, maybe they don't show up in a live and you're like, Ugh. so you make a phone call like, hey, haven't seen you in a while, what's going on? It can be super meaningful. Um, so that connection piece is crucial. And that's something that we as believers do naturally, right? We're supposed to um, maintain connections. So um, I want you to, we're running out of time, so we're going to skip one piece, but I'm going to tell you about it so you can do it at home. Um, in your notes, you have the paper with the blue bubbles. And this is, is really for your reference. Um, and I'm not going to go through it, but it can be a reference sheet for you any time. I would love for you to sit and read through it, like when you get home or next week, um, because it identifies some, uh, some warning signs that I haven't talked about and talks about you know, prior mental illness um, diagnoses or um, serious events in the family and uh, just a lot of things. So become familiar with that and as you talk to kids, if you've read this, like I asked you to, um, it will be in there and you'll go like, oh man, that's one of those things. I need to pay attention. Um, like for example, people who've been diagnosed with bipolar are some magnitude more likely to attempt suicide. Uh, men are more likely to complete suicide than women because they're m more aggressive and, you know, they're kind of built that way. Um, so read through this and, and just tuck it in the back of your mind. And then I'm going to pass these out. And we don't have time to do this. Would you be willing to pass these out for me? Thank you so much. Let me grab one. Um, yeah, so these are scenarios. Um, some of them are actually real, and uh, they're real people, and some of them are made up. And the exercise I was going to have you guys do was to partner up and pick a, um, pick a scenario and then answer the questions at the bottom. We don't have time to do that today, but... This, um, I think this covers a lot of the types of things you encounter in a live with your kids. Just, you know, random conversation or things that you might observe or things that you hear from other kids. Um, and each one of these it presents a different need for you to either approach the student or approach the parents. Um, or ask for help, of course. But um, so as you do this at home in your spare time, think about um, like, do I know a kid like this, or have I ever heard this kind of a situation before? And what would I do? The four questions at the bottom are: Do you approach the student if you're not already engaged in a conversation? Why or why not? Is this individual potentially suicidal? If yes, indicate what your next step should be. Um, and then who do you contact to help um, and or do you contact the student and why? Um, and then name three things or passages of scripture that might be meaningful to share with the student. Um, so this might be a helpful thing for you to do with your fellow Alive leaders as well. Any questions? Yeah. I, 
I almost always do, because <laughs> um, I, I just, I want to know, I want to understand, and I've just seen the positive um, fallout or outgrowth of connecting with people, and um, especially kids. When you notice them, um, when you remember them, it, and if you notice something strange, it's like, hey, I, I saw that, what, what, what's going on with you? Or, how are you doing? That's, sometimes that's all you need to do. But usually the answer is just go and, yeah. Um, and be sensitive about whether you should be very direct or not, so, yeah. Um, how would you handle a situation with someone that doesn't want help or is hesitant to even talk about it? Um, if you know that there's something there. Yeah, if you know that there's something there, that's really vague, but if you do, um, and they won't talk to you or don't want to talk about it, then that's probably the time to talk to parents. And just say, hey, you know, seem reluctant to talk to me. What do you think's going on? Um, or talk to other people that are connected, not students, but other adults that are connected with the, the, the young person and find out what you can. Um, but sometimes just being present and being quiet is enough to eventually open the door to their fe feeling like they can talk. That's a good question, yeah. Any other questions? We're going to do a Q&A, right? Well, you got to come up here, man. <laughs> so if you guys don't have any questions, that's OK. But <laughs> we thought we opened a whole lot of buckets and doors. and. Thought maybe you would want to ask. Um, another one about um, say someone is, is suicidal and they need uh, like that immediate help, but mm -hmm. they're hesitant or afraid of the police being called, mm -hmm. um, or just really like they don't want to go down that road. Like, how do you get them that help? Or you can, you just call, just make the call, <laughs> and I, I've had people be you know, just really mad at me. And I, at some level, don't care. It's a, it's a price I'm willing to pay because sometimes to love well, you have to do hard things. Um, so it, sometimes you'll get the statement, um, I don't want to tell you because you'll call the police. Well, then you know. <laughs> They've just told you that they're pretty serious about what they're going to do. Um, so you don't have to call the police, but since you're dealing with young people, you have to call the parents. You have to engage the adult in the child's life. By law, you have to do that. So um, you're, you're taking a step of care when you do that, too. Um, and, you know, you can do that even from a gut. You know, they haven't said, I'm going to kill myself, but everything's lining up. And um, they may not be explicitly suicidal, but they really need care. They need help. So, can I flip that on its head? Yeah. Uh, the the other the other side of that, and the reason I'm part of this Q and A is I'm just a person who's done this for a while. So, uh, sometimes those are great questions to ask, and sometimes it's really helpful to ask the inverse of it. What do I need to know to do nothing? Amen. That's good. Like. I better have a whole lot of data. I better have a whole lot of good vibes even. And even in training, they talk about gut and how you feel about the situation. We wouldn't ignore any of that. But, but if I'm talking about this area and I've got enough of these markers that I'm like, at the very least, I need to do a hand raise for someone else to help me. I have to have so much information to do nothing and go, oh, they'll be fine. So flip it on its head and you end up investigating yourself going, oh, I don't have enough to do nothing and therefore I'm willing to risk whatever because the outcome on the other end, it, it, real frankly, it, no one wants to deal with that. 
for the rest of their life. So you can think of it on the other end. What do I need to know to do nothing? And you might come up with, oh, I need a lot. Is that fair? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a wonderful fail safe. Yeah. No, it is. I've actually called 911 twice from two different people. Mm -hmm. One, it turned out it was more a attention seeking thing, but there were mm -hmm. things that needed to be mm -hmm. dealt with there. And that person no longer talked to me after that. And it was actually someone I just met three months before that. Um, and it was this long drawn out thing of you come do something or I'm going to kill myself. So I mm -hmm. took that as a yeah. Um, the other one was a friend of my husband and I was just over a year ago, and I actually called Matt Nestle, and Matt was like, you know, if you would call again, I don't know what I'm going to do, all mm -hmm. these things, and then we called the hotline, and we got a three-way call with his roommate, and the roommate was knocking on him saying, I need my medication, he's going like that, mm -hmm. and his roommate couldn't get a response, and then we had to call him again. So he was actually just asleep, he had it yeah. done and everything, but we wanted to make sure. Yeah. We didn't want to sleep, and so they did take him to the hospital. Yeah, good. Um, and so, um, in my mind, it was worth it. Yeah. Even if they're mad at you and never want to speak to you again, yeah. their life was worth more than it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, you can also do a well check with mm -hmm. the police. You can call the non-emergency number and, and just say, hey, this person has been suicidal and I can't get a hold of them and it's been three days or whatever. Can you please drive by? and and see if they're okay. And, and that's a thing they do. And I've, I've done that many times. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually did that last year with somebody I was counseling who was um, explicitly suicidal, had called the, the helpline and texted the text line and so on. And, and then he didn't show up for an appointment and I couldn't get hold of him. I was like, tried and tried and tried, had a couple other people try, and, and then I just, call, I actually called 911 and said, this is it, you know, I'm the, I'm the, uh, the counselor, and, um, and he was fine. He had forgotten <laughs> the appointment. He's never forgotten since. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he knows that he matters. Yeah. Yeah, for real. Any, any other questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering uh, about approaching from a Concerned parent, like if a parent's concerned, mm -hmm. and and how to approach it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to talk to our child; they won't open up to us. Mm -hmm. Does that just give you an inroad to, to go through some of those procedures that you talked about? Yeah, yeah, and but that's also one of the hardest situations <coughs> there is because the child won't talk to the parents, and then the parent sticks you on them, and they're like. I'm not going to talk to you, um, but it, it's important to be present and try and, and maybe not ask, unless it's a suicidality issue, not ask direct questions like, what's going on with you, man? Why won't you talk to your parents? You're not going to probably get anywhere with that, but, you know, hey, let's go get coffee um, or whatever. That might open the door. And you, you could actually give, fee I'll give something that I've done and then you could even give feedback whether or not this was a, a wise way. Are you saying as a concerned parent, you invite someone else to talk to a kid? Is that where your question was coming from? Yeah, so I've been in that situation and I'm pretty, this type of training has shown me that there's just some value in a, aggressive kind honesty. So I try to disarm that situation by going, hey, this is weird. I mean, your parents want me to talk to you, and you don't know me, and I'm old. <laughs> I, I, I've started there with kids multiple times, and the first time I, I might meet with that kid, we, we don't talk about Jesus. We don't talk about anything. 
I find out they like video games. And then we talk about video games because I like video games. And that's it. So there, there, there's part of that as, as the parent needs to know, we're not going to come in here and give the kid a Jesus badge. I, I, I'm going to try to build rapport with your kid, be honest about who I am, and go from there. Yeah, that's good. Like, this is, this is weird. It's weird for me, too. Yeah, so the way I handle that's good. excellent. Um, the way I handle that is um, I say, you know, I know you're here because your mom told you you had to come. Um, so are you here because you want to be? And sometimes they say yes. You know, like, I, I, I'm done with this. i got to figure it out. Yeah, I want to be here. But sometimes they say, I really don't want to be here. I say, and I say, okay, so let's just talk. And then we do that. And we just hang out and talk about stuff. And, and then at the end, I circle back and say, so how do you feel now? Well, I feel a little better, mm. whatever. Um, would you be willing to come back one more time? And they almost always say yes. It, it's amazing, but it's, I think because there's someone who's sitting there connecting, you know, trying to learn about them. There's something about that. Um, so taking it slow and finding rapport and common interests. Um, I met with a, a young lady years ago, an African-American girl who um, lived in the projects, and I don't think she thought I had anything in common with her. And um, I, I, as we were talking, something she said reminded me a movie, of a movie I'd just seen that happened to be a, a, like the first movie fully produced by a black director. She was like, you watch that movie? Are you kidding me? And then we talked about the movie and what it was I heard from her that connected with the movie. And from then on, we were BFFs. <laughs> it was amazing. So it just... Sometimes that, you know, listening and connecting is enough to move it down the road. Yeah. Can Anna? I just share a thought, too? Um, there was a kid in my high school class who thought he was drawing graffiti. And, like, we figured out yelling at him for drawing graffiti when we were working. Yeah. And, like, so I ended up just asking him. I called him up one day, and I said, I'm really bad at art, and I don't like to meet with people, but you're really good at art. <laughs> Would you do it? I love it. And that was the inroad. Like, mm -hmm. it was like months and months and months of getting nowhere. That's awesome. And then looking at the, what is he, like, he's, it's bad behavior in class, mm -hmm. but what's good about the bad behavior? Does that make sense? Like, a lot of yeah. kids wow. that get labeled, like, the bad kid, they usually are actually super smart and they're bored. Like, mm -hmm. you can find something to compliment them on that, that they're doing bad. I, I had a, a, a mentor, trainer, um, I, I've been in multiple classes, Victor. Um, Victor Veith, who, he, um, he's at the National Training Center, child safety training out of Minnesota. He trains everybody on child safety. Um, he's, he, I've never forgotten this. He was, he was describing, based his love for this research called the ACE research, Adverse Childhood Experience Research. And coming out of that, he said, one thing church world is terrible at is looking at kids with bad behavior and trying to get them to stop it when we should be really thankful for bad behavior because it lets you ask questions. Mm -hmm. Like those are the very people that you go, oh, why are you doing graffiti? Yeah. So I, lo I love that. That's a beautiful story. That's awesome. Yeah. to them tell me about the things that the Bible is very clear about this is sin or whatever, very uncomfortable mental health things, and not give them an answer, not say, well, this is what the Bible says, but letting them be honest about their real feelings, what brought them. 
happen here, their sinful behaviors, and not feeling the need to automatically just correct. Mm -hmm. It's opened up then being able to come to me and tell me, yeah, I'm, I'm having suicidal thoughts. I'm, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Mm -hmm. But still, it's very hard for me to not be like, okay, mm -hmm. well, we need to da 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 But it's, it's put, it doesn't have it solved everything. No. Are they still struggling with their mental health? Yes. But I actually know what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think I have a doorway to, you know, they, they trust me. Mm -hmm. um, they come to me. And so I think I'm able to kind of head things off a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're able to get help when we need to get help instead of, you know. Mm -hmm. So the idea of what y'all are talking about is people who come alongside of parents kind of mm -hmm. can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We don't always have to just be, okay, here's the problem, let's discipline. It doesn't mean that there's not room for discipline. It doesn't mean that, that God doesn't shed light on these things. But if mm -hmm. we automatically come to everything with, well, this is what the Word says. They need to hear the Word, right? But sometimes they just need to be heard mm -hmm. so that they're open to hear in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is awesome. Thank you. Well done. Yeah, for real. What's your name? Betsy. Betsy. I'm Lynn. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I think we're at our end here. Beautiful. Any other questions? Final ones. I did ask a question. Um, we were talking about involving parents in external suicidal ideation mm -hmm. and everything. Um, what is the parent or the main cause of the suicidal ideation when you still involve parents, mm -hmm. even though they're in a situation? Yeah, you can't, you, you're not in a position to know that. Okay. You can suspect that, mm -hmm. but you're still required by law to involve the guardian, the parent or the guardian, to protect the child. And, and if you suspect that, that the child's being abused at home, um, then that's a, another conversation, that's a DSS call, and, um, and they may be removed from the home, you don't know, but you always have to move to protect the child. Okay. And the first step is always to connect to it with the parent or the guardian. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So what's the best way to uh, go forward with kid mentioning suicidal ideation in the middle of groups? So like, do you ask the question, the, those direct questions in mm -hmm. groups? Do you hold them outside or wait until after groups? Yeah. Holy cow, that's hard. Um, I think it would depend on the time and whether or not you're alone as the leader. Um, if someone, if you have a co-leader, then it could be right to, you know, say, hey, let's, let's go talk. Um, I, would, I would say my gut says wouldn't ask those direct questions in front of anyone else. Um, but it could be that you pull them out with someone else. I actually had that happen at the deeper weekend, right? Um, had a room with about eight or 10 people and a child right in front of me um, talking about suicidal ideation, what do you do and how do you help a friend and things like that. And she cannot hold back the tears, just sucking wind, man, sobbing. And so I stopped the class and there was a, a woman behind her who is a lay counselor, and I and she didn't know this girl was crying, and I was like, I got to stop and do something. So I connected the two of them and and asked her to go out with the child and 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 talk, and it was very productive. It was incredible, and it was a God thing how that turned out. So, um, yeah. So I want to tell you guys two really s short stories. One's r really hard and sad, and one's really amazing and beautiful just super quick. Story number one, um, I'll do the, well, I won't tell you which one is which. Um, so I had a student, uh, this is when I was at, at the high school, um, come and, and eat lunch with me. I wasn't her school counselor, but she just picked me. I'm like, okay. And she would come sit on the floor in my office and we'd talk and I'd eat my lunch and she'd eat her lunch and and eventually, you know, after a couple months, I asked her, what, you know, how come you don't sit with your friends? And she told me, um, I have braces and 
all these girls make fun of me because my food gets stuck in my braces. And I just don't want to sit down there and eat my lunch. And my heart just, oh, it just broke. Um, so of course it was fine for her to keep coming to sit and eat lunch with me. Well, it turns out I didn't know that there were some really bullying girls that had gotten her phone number and left messages and harassed her. It was horrible. And so on um, Easter vacation or spring break, she killed herself. Um, and I, I had no idea that she was suicidal. Um, I had no idea she wasn't my kid. Um, and she mattered to me. Her name was Melissa Vest, and she's, you know, buried across the street up the road. Um, so that, that was a huge learning experience for me. Kids do things for reasons. They, they do. And so asking and in, inviting conversation is super important. So that's story number one. That's the hard, sad one. Um, story number two. I got a call, um, a student had locked herself in an office that had a security door, so there was no key for the door, and it was on the second floor of the building. And um, so I got a call after hours that this girl was in the office and they didn't know what to do, and I, I, wasn't, I hadn't finished my degree at that point, I was still working on it. And they said, well, we think you're the person that needs to talk to this girl. <laughs> Okay, so I sat on the other side of the door on the floor, and her name was Kathy, talked to her, asked her, you know, so what's going on? She said, I'm going to kill myself. And so I, I wasn't trained, but I asked her, so do you have a plan? And she said, well, yeah, I have a bottle of pills right here in my hand. And um, so I said, well, well, tell me about that. What? what is drawing you to want to do that. And she told me all these things, heavy things in her life. And, um, but it turned out that she had voices telling her that she had to take her life, that that was the only choice. And when I heard that, I was like, well, what are the voices saying now? And so we had this conversation through the door about the voices. And I said, well, would you tell the voices this for me? And, and she did. And, and it, it, the whole thing lasted about 30 minutes. And eventually we together convinced the voices that there might be another way, you know, another plan. So she opened the door and she gave me the bottle of pills. And meanwhile, the administrator had called 911 and they were waiting. Um, so Kathy was taken to the hospital. She spent, I don't know, probably six weeks in the hospital and um, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. and medicated and then like a year later I got a letter from her and she had found Jesus and because I had talked to her about the Lord I prayed with her through the door um, and I didn't you know public school and you know I just said whatever I, that's where my faith is and I'm going to pray over her um, but she found the Lord and thanked me and all and I didn't know what I was doing I just wanted to know and understand. Um, so that was before I got my master's degree. It was, it was a long time ago. But it just, I've returned to that over and over again. Like, God gives you in the moment what you need. And if you, if you invite that, if you say, Spirit, I, I don't know what to say. Help me. Give me words. Mm. Help me not to be afraid. Um, <coughs> I, I just would encourage you to, to trust God in those moments and don't be afraid. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and just talk. So, Kathy, Amen. yeah. So, that's it. Any other questions? Dawson, can I pray over everybody here at the end? And um, I, I always, I'm a summarizer by nature. So, a, as you leave, lots of words in three hours. Um, Know your calling, love God, love neighbor, be curious, mm -hmm. take the specific training that you've been given, review it so you can um, it, it, use it, and always be willing to throw the hand up and ask for help. And that's why we've been here all day. That's it. Can I say one more thing? Of course. And you're not experts. You're not, 
none of you are experts, and all of you need help. I need and help. Alone. And yeah. yes, that's exactly. You're not alone in the fight. Yeah. So I, I don't want you to leave here saying, ah, oh, I know what to do. Because I, you know, my training in this was days long and multiple classes and all the things. Um, and I don't feel fully prepared either. I'm still learning. So ask for help. We're here for you. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> the God of Jacob is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear, even if the earth gives way under our feet, even if the waters be thrown into the sea and the waters roar and foam. God of Jacob, the Lord of hosts, is his name, and he is with us. And so, Father, in a moment like this where we've talked about heavy things and hard things and ways to minister to people, we, we remind ourselves that you are so powerful. You're so powerful that right now, if the earth were to drop away underneath us and we were floating in air, we're all fine. And so as we approach helping teens or helping our kids or helping this church, Remind us of your power as we go today. Um, and God, we, we just intercede for your mercy on this younger generation. Um, we ask for angelic presence to guard our kids against the enemy. Um, we ask for a revival of understanding who Jesus is in real life. Um, God, we pray against uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the great enemies of all of us, but especially of our kids. We pray against them in your name. We're not necessarily wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and evil places. God, we are wrestling against um, a broken creation, that schizophrenia was never part of creation, that there are people who are acting ways because their brains and bodies are broken, and, and we beg you for wisdom to discern what's going on to the degree we can. So God, give us courage to love. And to trust you. God, thank you that there are partnerships in this, both within the church and without, with medical professionals, with um, th therapeutic professionals. Um, we have so many blessings in our culture. We can quickly complain about the culture we live in, but compared to other places in the world, we have vast resources, many of which are even free. Give us thankful hearts as your people. And so would you now bless us, equip us with everything good that we may do your will in this area through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.